Carolina Insider is presented by Wells Fargo, official sponsor of Carolina Athletics. We're back. Time for another edition of the Carolina Insider. Thanks so much for being with us. I'm Jones. He's Adam. The show brought to you by Wells Fargo. When our communities need us, Wells Fargo is here to help. And we are here to help you get ready for some big time postseason college basketball. Adam, it is March and that means it is tournament time, sir. Well, I think we know why the NCAA tournament moved the first round games back a day. Why is that? Thursday's Carolina Insider Video Pod yeah, Day. Right. They don't want to go head to head with that with those first round matchups. Just throw the first four out there on Thursday, get that over with so people can focus on the video pod. We're going to talk men's tournament and women's tournament as we move through the show. We'll get you up to date on some other sports around Carolina as well, plus go through our social drive too. So we have a bunch to do. Let's get started. And Adam, let's start with men's basketball. Carolina, since we last met you, had a successful run in the ACC tournament. Didn't get to the ultimate goal of winning that tournament's championship, but a convincing victory against Notre Dame, a good win against a solid uh, and hard-playing Virginia Tech team, and then a back-and-forth game with Florida State that, unfortunately for Carolina, the Seminoles were able to pull out at the end. But in total, it felt like a successful trip to Greensboro for Carolina. Yeah, Carolina, dominant performance against Notre Dame, and nice to see that that capability is in the tank for the Tar Heels. And then the kind of win they really needed against a team that you felt like was on pretty equal footing with Carolina this year and Virginia Tech, so that's a good win over them. And then, honestly, Tar Heels played about 18 really good minutes against Florida State, didn't play well in the first half, and didn't play well in the final two minutes. But as we've talked to some players and coaches since then, feel like they got some benefits from that game that will help them in Purdue and going forward. Adam, I was a little surprised. First of all, congratulations to Armando Baycott. He made the first team all ACC tournament. He averaged a double-double in the three games, actually had a double-double in two of the games, averaged better than 16 points. I was surprised R.J. Davis wasn't on either one of the tournament teams in Greensboro, but good to see Armando play well. And really, Carolina's big guys were dominant storylines in the two wins in Greensboro. Yeah, it was a lot of what we've talked about all year, where you may not have all four playing great all at one time, but on any given day, you're probably going to get at least two. And that's what Carolina did in Greensboro. Just a nice combination, uh, nice combinations working together. Walker Kessler was good sometimes, and when he wasn't, you brought in Dayron Sharp. Garrison Brooks hit a couple shots, and when he wasn't, you had Armando Baycott putting up double-doubles. So that's how Carolina is going to have to win games moving forward. And that moving forward is indeed into the NCAA tournament. Adam mentioned Purdue because Carolina is playing in Purdue's home arena. That is Mackey Arena in West Lafayette, Indiana. Tar Heels the number eight seed in the South region. They'll be taking on the nine seed in that bracket. That is the Wisconsin Badgers. 51st all-time appearance for Carolina in the NCAA tournament. That is the second most all-time. And Adam... Oddly enough, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, Carolina's had some success as the eight seed in its history. And uh, to have success, though, this year, um, boy, it's going to be challenging. Uh, they're facing a veteran team that plays a totally different style than what the Tar Heels traditionally like to do when they're going to see Wisconsin. Yeah, Carolina's familiar with Wisconsin from some matchups in the past. Uh, you've had some ACC Big Ten matchups. You've had some NCAA tournament matchups. But you know in their current version, Wisconsin's going to play more slowly, kind of Virginia light. They're not as good as Virginia, and they're not as committed to that style as Virginia is under Tony Bennett, where you just cannot force them to run. But Wisconsin's got a lot of veteran players. We know Carolina is a younger team, so it'll be interesting to see how those two things come together in an NCAA tournament where, as we know, a lot of times experience matters. Fifth all-time meeting between these two teams, third of which has come in the NCAA tournament. Carolina beat Wisconsin in the round of eight in Syracuse to move on to the Final Four and eventually win the national title in 2005. Wisconsin got the win out in Los Angeles in 2015 in the Sweet 16. The Badgers advanced to the title game that year before falling just short of the championship. That game is a few minutes after 7 o'clock on Friday night. Again, that is in West Lafayette, Indiana. Now, Adam, of course, as we know, the entire NCAA tournament is being played in the state of Indiana with most of the sites 
in Indianapolis, but there are a couple outside there, like West Lafayette, which is about approximately an hour and 15 minutes from Indianapolis. So it is a unique scenario, Adam, for players, staff, everybody this year in the controlled environment that is the NCAA tournament. We've talked about this since football. I, I am completely convinced some high seed is going to lose in this NCAA tournament because they just don't handle the environment well. They don't handle being cooped up in the hotel. They don't like being told what they can do and can't do. And some of their attention gets distracted from the actual basketball. Somebody's going to lose and they will then say after the game, well, we just lost our focus a little bit because of all these unusual things going on. Don't feel like that's going to be the Tar Heels, though. I feel like they've handled it pretty well throughout the course of the year, and you know Roy Williams is going to get them focused on basketball. So I don't think that's a concern on the Carolina side, but I think nationally, just because of how different this is going to be, I think that'll end up being a story at some point. Well, this, of course, is the Carolina Insider, and we have a true insider inside what's happening in the controlled environment in the Indianapolis area. That is Tar Heel AD Bubba Cunningham. Bubba was on the NCAA Tournament Selection Committee. Uh, Adam and I are going to talk to him a bunch about that. We're going to talk to him about what it's like inside that controlled environment right now and just what the next couple weeks hold for Bubba and the NCAA Tournament. We had a chance to catch up with him a little bit earlier. Going to let you listen to that. Then we have a bunch more to do, including talking NCAA Women's Tournament. That and more still to come on the Carolina Insider. If it's a Thursday, it must be time for Bubba Cunningham to join the Carolina Insider on the video pod where he essentially hosts the show. <laughs> he hasn't had very much going on this year, so he decided to add NCAA Tournament Selection Committee duties to everything else he's been doing. Bubba, thanks so much for, for carving out a few minutes for us. What has, especially Sunday and then this week, been like? Thanks, Adam Jones. It's great to be with you guys, and uh, it's, it's been a lot of fun. Um, I got up to Indianapolis uh, Tuesday. We started meeting on Wednesday. So Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, we were working on seating and bracketing for the tournament. And uh, then they had the reveal show on, on Sunday night. And I thought Mitch Barnhart did a great job talking about the, the bracket and uh, incredible work by Dan Gavitt, Joanne Scott, and the entire NCAA basketball staff. The logistics associated with this tournament is incredible. And uh, they've done a marvelous job with it. So it's been really interesting to, to be a part of it. It's been wonderful to, um, to help in a small way. And uh, it was really good seeing all the teams come in over the last 48 hours. And the logistics of getting 28 people, 2,800 people into this controlled environment and then having practices available, weight rooms available. And now they're practicing at the competition venues. It's uh, certainly unique, but it's been an awful lot of fun. So Bubba, did you actually have to walk out of the room when Carolina was being discussed in, in these different conversations as far as the bracket and, and seeding everyone? Well, great question. And yes, I mean, and they're very particular about that. So anytime Carolina was about to be discussed, I would have to leave. I can't ask, answer any questions about anybody else in our conference unless it's a factual information. Did so-and-so play or did this happen or not happen? I can answer those questions, but the quality of a team, the any of my opinion relative to anybody in our league, I can't express that at all. And there's four commissioners right now on the basketball committee. And anytime a school in their league is talked about, they have to leave the room as well. And they have a pretty cool little contraption there. It's a little doorbell, actually, one that you'd put on your door. <laughs> and they've hooked up a ringer in the other room. And when you're out, They'll ring the doorbell and bring you back in. And um, you just wonder how long you're about there in the hallway. But they're very serious about not having the, a school or a conference influence the decision of the other nine members of the committee. What's something about the selection and seating process that you couldn't have known unless you were in that room? And once you were in the room, you thought, huh, I never, never thought of it this way. Well, I mean, gosh, I learned so many different things about it. Number one is the depth of research that all the committee members do. You hear it talked about all the time and, you know, the body of work and all the different jargon that we use when it comes down to Selection Sunday. But it's all very true that, you know, I was assigned three conferences this year as the primary person that watched those games. 
and the amount of detail that is discussed in the room in every conference, every team was a bit startling to me. Uh, the, you know, how many players were available for this game? How many games did they miss for COVID? What was their home record, their road record? What was the conference record, the non-conference record? Where were the neutral site games? And then the, the depth of the players who was injured when this team lost to that team. I, I did not expect that. The amount of detail in seeding was incredible. I mean, the first part, as you could imagine, is getting the teams into the tournament. And then the second part is to seed them. And to go line by line, one versus two, two versus three, three versus four. Whoops, I think four is better than three. So then you have to go, okay, compare three to the two and continue to do that. It it was painstakingly um, long, but I think overall it was well worth it. Did you learn something about a team or about basketball or anything during that process that, that you were not anticipating maybe learning going through this? Well, I certainly learned a lot about the teams that weren't in the leagues that I was covering. I was the primary for the Southern Conference. I was the primary for the MEAC, and I was the primary for the Mountain West. And so I knew those leagues. I knew the players. I knew the coaches. I knew the records. But the uh, I did not have as much detail on those other ones, even the ones running the secondary. And Clint, uh, Clint Gwaltney and Steve Kirshner helped me this year in trying to figure out what I'm to do in this, in this new role. And there's actually Richard Kerouac in our office who does an awful lot of work in, comp in compliance and financial aid in particular, but he is a master at statistics and analysis. And so I actually worked with him as well to help me look at the metrics that they're used, whether it's the predictive metrics or the ones that are just the statistics from the game. And he helped me put together a couple of different charts in a way to look at the, you know, look at the RPI or the, uh, the net, look at their various strengths of schedules, all of that stuff. So he was invaluable down the stretch as well. This is, I think, kind of similar to what Jones just asked, but did you, what if anything, did you learn that you might share with Roy Williams and maybe Clint Gwaltney that might help them build stronger credentials for Carolina in, in seasons to come? Well, one thing that everyone thinks that there's one item that's going to make the difference. And I think, you know, gosh, Coach Williams has been doing this for so long. I think he has the absolute right attitude, which is we're going to play the very best schedule we can possibly play, and we need to win a lot of games. Ultimately, you have to play and you have to win. You can look at all the metrics you want, but the one that matters the most is how many did you win, how many did you lose, and who did you play? We, we're all looking for that one magic formula. It's, it's not there. And you've got 10 different people on the committee, Everyone comes with a different perspective and they're going to apply their perspective to their ranking. So when we're asked to rank these 10 schools and whether or not they're going to be in the tournament, we each get a vote. And if you get eight of the 10 votes, your team, that team goes into the candidates for selection. And if they don't get eight out of 10 votes, they're still in kind of the, the waiting room, hoping to get an invitation to the tournament. So Bubba, th there was the, really unusual uh, set of circumstances this year, of course, with COVID that led to you having these standby teams and teams that had to kind of wait a few extra days to see if a slot may open up. How did you guys handle all of that and, and having that brand new group of teams that weren't quite officially not in and, until the end of the day on Tuesday? Yeah, well, we tried, you know, we had to get to 72 teams basically. And the other thing I found interesting is that you literally have to do four or five different brackets. Sometimes they say they've done up to 12 brackets on Sunday night, because if a certain team wins their conference and they're an automatic qualifier and no one else would have gotten in, they're going to bump somebody out of the tournament. Somebody else might just get a different seed. And then that would domino a couple of other seeds within the tournament. And that would obviously affect the bracket. So I guess one of the things I, I did learn is you literally are there on Saturday and Sunday watching those games. And in this case, you know, because Oregon State won the Pac-12 tournament on Saturday night, that bumped Louisville out of the tournament. And if one more team would have had an upset in the conference tournament on Sunday, Drake would have been out. And so literally there is a numeric order to these teams and those upsets make all the difference in the world.
and and you hate to do it, but that's when the intensity is really at its peak. When you're in the room recognizing that you're going to vote, and this is the 60, and I always call it the 64th or 65th team, recognizing that there's 68 teams, but it, it's a hard line, and, and you do feel a lot of pressure when you're, when you're trying to make that last assessment. You mentioned Louisville getting bumped. Looking at the teams that were in and out and the seeds that the teams that are in received, it didn't seem like the, the ACC had very strong credentials in the eyes of the committee. What, what was it about the ACC that wasn't as well received nationally since we don't always see it that way since we're right here in the middle of it? Well, I think we, know, we did get seven teams in, so I think there's respect for the league, but I think we would all agree we probably didn't have the elite team or teams that we typically have. So the quantity was there, but maybe, maybe not the quality we've had in the past. And, and that may be due to the number of games that were played. I mean, to begin with, we all lost about five home games that we typically have. And Coach Williams talked about that throughout the year. To get a young team prepared, you really want to play a couple of games at home early to build some confidence. We never had the ability to do that, nor did anybody else in our league. And so we ended up missing games in at the very beginning, 27 instead of 31. And then we beat each other and then we had COVID. So we had a fair number of pauses within the conference throughout the year. And so we just never gained any consistency. So the other leagues just did a little bit better job with that. And, you know, the big 10 had a phenomenal year getting nine teams in that was, that was remarkable. But uh, overall, I think that the uh, evaluation by the committee, I think was very strong. And when you, you, you see the, the bracket, I think people think it was, uh, it was done really well. So Bubba, what happens now for you? Do you, are you are you bubbled up here until the end of the tournament as a committee member? Yeah, yeah. How about that? So <laughs> usually, what happens on the committee is you, you go to New York, where they've been doing this recently, and you 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 build the bracket. Then everyone flies home on Sunday and actually misses the show, and then you're home Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. If you've got a a Thursday site, you'd leave on Tuesday. If you have a Friday site, you'd leave on Wednesday. But since we're in this controlled environment, as we're calling it, we, we stay. So I came here on March 9th and I go home April 6th after the uh, final four. And so there'll only be 16 teams here next Monday, but um, that that's the unusual part. So I've been to the convention center a number of times in the last couple of days. We have 12 practice courts set up over there. We have six weight room facilities set up over there. And the teams are now practicing there and today at the various venues. So right now I'm at Hinkle Fieldhouse in uh, one of their hospitality rooms and Florida's out there practicing right now. Georgia Tech was earlier today. Virginia Tech was, was uh, the first team to practice. And we have uh, four more practice or three more practices after Florida this afternoon six more practices tomorrow here at Hinkle. And then we play three games at Hinkle on um, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Friday, Saturday, we play three games each Sunday and Monday. We have two games here in Hinkle. So it, it's a lot of games in the next uh, four days. Well, while you're there, Jones and I really appreciate you leaving us in charge. And what we've done is <laughs> we now have five number one ranked teams here at Carolina while you're up there in Indianapolis, we've been doing a great job. I just wonder how how is that kind of success received by your peers? Do do they say like you guys have really got it going on there in Chapel Hill? How do you do it? What what is that like? Yeah, I mean, there's just tremendous respect for Carolina. And so yesterday was our first practice over in um, the convention center, and I walked over with with Coach Williams, and the team was working out. And so we walked the convention space with uh, Coach Rob, Clint, myself, and and Coach Williams. And the number of people that came up to him and said hello and talked about Carolina, talked about all the great things going on, it really it makes you feel good. You got a lot of have a lot of pride with our coaches and our student athletes and what they've accomplished, not just this year, but throughout our history. And there's just a lot of there's great respect for the University of North Carolina, and to and to be here with a lot of peers, it really does make you feel good and very proud. But before we let you go, why is all this? worth it. I mean, I think we all love watching the, the tournament, of course, because we love college basketball, but I'm not sure people quite understand how important this tournament is. What, why are all these things that are happening, all these protocols, all the extremes that, that everyone's going to, why, why is it so important to do this? 
Well, that's a great question. In fact, when uh, Georgia Tech finished their practice, I walked out to the bus with Josh Pastner, their head coach, and he, we talked about that for a while. It started in the fall. You know, why did we play football? Why did we play soccer? Why did we play volleyball? It's because part of the educational experience for these students, not just the ones that play, is to have sports as part of their environment. So while we didn't get a ton of students to go to football games this year, some of them got to go. We tried to create experiences that are memorable for these people, for the students. And for the students that got to play, it was the one thing that they really loved doing. They got to practice, they got to play. And so this tournament, same thing, and it you know, marks the, the, you know, the one year anniversary of shutting everything down. There's a real sense of, of relief, although people are very serious about the protocols and they're really minding their business and how to conduct themselves. They understand how important it is to do that, but it's something that they've all been looking forward to and expecting that, that we're hoping they'd be able to play this year. Having a few fans is something spectacular, but this is really important to them and it's part of their educational experience. And I think that that's probably the most important thing that, that we've learned is being together and doing things that you normally do is really important to our, our, our mental well-being. And I'm glad we have this chance. Well, Adam, we know now we have free reign here in Chapel Hill until April 6th as Bubba right. remains in the controlled environment. And so we'll, we'll try not to ring that tab too large while you're gone, Bubba. Hey, 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 fellas. Now, we've been we're on Zoom for a year. You, I, you didn't realize that whether or not I was in town or not. So just because I told you I'm out of town, <laughs> just, just don't do anything that gets me fired, if you would. We will do our best. Thank you so much for joining us, Bubba. Always appreciate the time. Look forward to talking with you again soon. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. We appreciate Bubba's time. Interesting stuff, Adam, I thought, from Bubba as far as the seating, just everything that goes on in that room when you're trying to build a bracket. For something that's so big nationally as the NCAA tournament, I feel like we know precious little about what actually happens in the room. So great to hear about it from somebody who got his first opportunity to be in the room this year. All right, let's transition to the women's side of things because Carolina is one of three programs nationally to have the men in the NCAA tournament, the women in the NCAA tournament, and to compete in a New Year's Six bowl game as far as football is concerned. And for the women's basketball side, Adam, it is a number 10 seed in what is being called the Hemisphere region because all of the women's tournament is being played in San Antonio, Texas this season. Carolina will face off with Alabama, the number seven seed in that region. That game is scheduled for Monday at noon. These two teams have met twice before in NCAA tournament play with Carolina winning both times. We've mentioned this in leading up to this moment, uh, a real positive step forward it feels like in year two for Courtney Banghart. First NCAA tournament for Courtney Banghart at Carolina. Tar Heels may be a little closer to the cut line than they thought they were. You saw them in that 8-9 range in a lot of the projections and end up as a 10. Of course, if you can win that first game, you prefer to be a 10 uh, because then in theory you play a 2 next. But look, Courtney Banghart and the Tar Heels aren't worried about that. They want to beat Alabama on Monday at noon in that first round game and then see what happens after that. Team left for Texas on Wednesday morning. After they arrived, we had the chance to talk to Courtney Banghart, the head coach of the Tar Heels. Let's talk to Coach Banghart. Come back. We'll go through the rest of the show after this on the Carolina Insider. We are excited to be joined by the head coach of Carolina's women's basketball team, Courtney Banghart. She and her squad just arriving in San Antonio for the NCAA Women's Tournament. They begin action on Monday against Alabama. We're going to get to the basketball, but coach, we have right here, we've got a dozen of the Old Roy Donuts from Dunkin' Donuts, from Dunkin'. Now, two things. Number one, these have these are chocolate with Boston cream on the inside. Are you a fan of this type of donut? Oh yeah, I mean a Boston cream. That's like kind of where I'm from. Yeah, oh yeah, that's right. See now, Adam doesn't like the cream. Yeah. I am all in on the Boston cream. It gets in the way of my donut. Don't so, be messing I would with prefer, my donut. Well, you didn't. He didn't. You didn't give me the either or. I mean, if I could have a jelly donut or a glaze with chocolate, now we're talking. Okay. Well, that was my next question. If we're gonna get the old Courtney donut at some point, what's what's the old Courtney donut gonna be? Ooh, we can go one of two ways. I'll let Adam make the final decision. Uh, chocolate with coconut flakes all over the top. Ooh. Or um, the regular, just 
good old blonde glazed donut with some chocolate sprinkle on top. Ooh, mm. Adam, your final decision? Either's a great option. I like how the coconut adds some texture on top oh. of the chocolate, but it's hard to go wrong with that classic donut with the chocolate sprinkles on it. Either way, we're all winners. By the way, if you buy one of these, 50 cents for every Old Roy donut purchased at Dunkin' until March 27th goes to either the Food Bank of Metrolina or to the UNC Children's Hospital. So it's a great cause, delicious donut. Check it out at Dunkin'. Now let's talk a little basketball. Coach, how has your life been for the last few days after learning that you guys were indeed in the tournament and that you're facing a very good Alabama team in round one? Yeah, it's been it's been great. I mean, this is, um, you know, it's been a really unique year for everybody. But um, as I said to my team, what the great thing about the NCAA tournament is even when you come from a tradition uh, like, uh, you guys still there? We're here. Okay, good. Sorry. Even when you come from a um, tradition like Carolina, you, you don't get in because of your tradition. You get in based on what you did the last uh, 364 days. And, uh, you know, this team had to, had to scrap and claw and, and be really good late uh, in order to get their get their bid. But um, you know, it's, I've been a few times before and I, it just never gets old, the excitement of earning something that so few can get. You know, Joan, sometimes people accuse us of only, pe only having people on the video pod who provide items for our pod studio. We now know that's definitely not true because we know Courtney Banghart has never provided us with anything that's for right. the pod studio despite repeated requests. That being said, I, I'm sure there's a logical reason for that. Coach, uh, what do you think it says about this group that not just winning enough basketball games to get into the tournament, but weathering all this other stuff to, to maintain that level of play that's necessary to go to the postseason? Yeah, I think especially, um, first of all, you know, so I'm just ignoring the previous part, the, the beginning of that question. <laughs> that's what you've been doing every other time we've asked you, so that's exactly what we would expect. Hey, you got the good thing is you got to wait for. Um, yeah, you know, I think this what what made it really tricky for for us obviously is we're sort of in the um, in the process of rebuilding this great brand, and um, and then you throw all the new faces. So we've got three players on our roster that were even on the in, on the team last year. So you add all these new faces, you take away a non conference, you take away sort of the 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 excitement of playing in front of fans. Um, you take the mental breaks away where they get a chance to regroup and maybe have 48 hours off and go home or even a, a longer stretch after the ACC tournament. Yeah, there's been just a lot of different things that are usually an experienced team can handle. Um, and I know on the men's side uh, and our side, we just don't have experienced teams. So we've got to have to, it's a, it's a really tough thing for a young group and um, really great that both programs are dancing. Coach, one of those young players is Deja Kelly. And, of course, she hasn't done this by herself. You guys ha have a lot of veterans, Janelle Bailey and, and Petra Holoshinska and others. Well, but it seems like Deja Kelly has really made some strides here late in the year. I know she was very highly recruited, very highly thought of, very high talent player. H how have you seen her grow as you guys have gotten to this point in the season? Yeah, I love that you asked that because I think sometimes that um, the stars, they come in with a big target on their back and then everyone has an expectation for what their journey and trajectory is going to look like. Um, and, you know, everybody's journey is really different. You know, everybody's trajectory is um, and, and their path to get there is, is really different. And you have someone like Alyssa Usby on our team who came in the least recruit, least highly ranked kid in, the, in that class and um, obviously really kind of had a sprint into her college career. Um, and Deja had to process a lot more. Obviously, the ball's in her hand a lot. She's having to play off uh, with the ball in, in her hands as opposed to playing on the wing, uh, which she played a lot of in high school. Um, and, and she just kind of stuck with it and dealt with the adversity and the, um, and the expectation in a way that was true to her. And I give her a lot of credit because she could have packed it in and said, I'm just going to... I'm just going to get better in the offseason and come back, come back ready to fight. Um, and she just, thankfully, as she has played better, so have we. So, uh, yeah, her trajectory has been her own, and I'm, I'm certainly glad it's where it is right now. While we've been sitting here eating donuts, I know you've probably been watching Alabama. What have you seen from the Crimson Tide that will be important on Monday at noon? You know, they, they start, literally, I think they're for, I think they're all 12 or seniors. I mean, they've got so much experience. I know their first five were on that team that played a lot last year as well. Um, you know, they, they're, they're, they've they got a little bit of everything because of that. They've got three legitimate scorers that have uh, consistently scored all year long um, that are really experienced in SEC play. They, they, they play zone, they play man, they kind of have this funky zone actually um, as well. So that will take a little bit of adjustment for us. Um, and they, they're good in the open court. They've got good size inside. I mean, they've, they've really got a lot, of, a lot of things as you'd expect for a tournament team. Coach, this might be a hard question to answer, but is this – 
about where you thought you would be in, in year two, you know, m making the tournament, make, seeing some very clear strides from year one to year two. Is, is this where you hope to be, where you thought you would be? Do, do you even think in those terms? You know, I think probably more hoped. You know, I think when we when we got here, um, I first took a little bit of time to assess where we were at. I knew where I wanted to go. I just had to figure out how to get there, right, with what we had and, and what the steps needed to be. And then you throw in a global pandemic. I mean, it's just been a lot, right? And uh, you know, to, to have so many new faces and have to rely so much on um, really Janelle's consistent leadership, as well as the grad transfers that we had to sort of bring in late. And then of course our um, so many freshmen, you know, um, they've, they've done they've done a lot to get it, to get to the tournament in just my second year and really their first year. So, uh, you know, I give them a lot of credit. It's probably more, more I hoped for it than thought for it. So again, it is Monday, Carolina and Alabama in the first round of the NCAA Women's Tournament. Before we let you go, I know you're relatively new to it, but what is life like there in San Antonio and uh, as far as trying to isolate and get yourself uh, ready to go as far as the tournament is concerned? Yeah, I, mean, I think for the college kids, it's a chance for them to, they can, you know, they're still taking classes, they're student athletes and they, they watch Netflix, they listen to music, they FaceTime, they TikTok. That's not really the things that I kind of do during the day. So, you know, when I thought that it was going to be sort of this first, you know, two negative tests, um, you know, and then we'd be able to exercise outside and do some things that kind of are more typical to my days. And I literally, I guess I just blanked out that part of the message. So I was in the, um, we were on our bus ride to the hotel and I had said to our director of ops, you know, from like three seats away, since we all sit so far apart, I said, um, is there a, um, is there a good, do we know if there's a good loop or near our hotel? Um, and that, that led to the conversation that, no, I'm like never leaving the hotel, like not even, uh, you know, that's just never happening. So to be honest, it still sort of hit me. And so I'm, I'm sort of like, what? Um, so luckily I've, I've kind of, I've got about 20 strides from the end of the room to the end of the room. So I'm going to be, uh, I don't know, planking and, and lunging and I don't know what else to try to, uh, to try to make that happen. But um, yeah, it's a totally different type of tournament. It's a totally different type of year. I'm really grateful for our administration. I told Bubba that for he asked us if we wanted to play, and I said yes, and he's done everything he can do to make sure that can happen. Um, and then so has the NCAA. So I'm just glad to be here. I'm glad there's a tournament, and I, if the bubble means we can play, um, then bring on the lunches, I guess. All right, we can send you some donuts for your room <laughs> you if you'd go. like. Just, you can plank and eat some donuts. It'd be awesome. You say that, and then I bet you're not going to send them. Just like I told Adam, I would bring <laughs> something by, and I haven't done it. So we're one for one now. Netflix, FaceTime, and TikTok. That's my normal day. Yeah, that's a normal Wednesday for Adam. No big deal. Coach, thank you so much for your time. Best of luck in the tournament, not just on Monday, but hopefully beyond that as well. And uh, everybody stay safe and healthy there in San Antonio. I appreciate it. Awesome to see you guys. Go Heels. Of course, March is synonymous with basketball, but there is a lot of other stuff happening around Carolina athletics. And Adam, if stuff is happening around Carolina, that means that stuff is happening at the very top level because Carolina has five number one teams competing right now in Chapel Hill. Look at that, men's lacrosse, women's lacrosse, men's tennis, women's tennis, field hockey, number one, number one, number one, number one, number one. One, one, one. That's incredible. I think we talk about it every week, so I feel like the shine is wearing off. It's just as incredible this week as it was three weeks ago that all these teams and Jones, as we're going to talk about, these teams aren't just winning. Yeah, they're boat racing some folks, and they did it again this past week. Men's lacrosse picked up a quality win against Virginia. That victory over the Cavaliers, also a ranked team. Uh, elevated Carolina back to number one. The guys have been bouncing around between one and two kind of week to week, even though they are still undefeated. And congratulations to uh, goalkeeper Colin Krieg. He was the ACC and National Defensive Player of the Week. 20 saves against Virginia. That was a really good road win for the Tar Heels. ACC, as always, strong in men's lacrosse. Women's lacrosse, Adam, you mentioned boat racing and get your speed boat ready 22 to 1 the women's lacrosse team won at Virginia Tech this past weekend the women are still a clear number one in the nation women's tennis men's tennis both still undefeated as well they picked up some midweek victories after successful weekends and field hockey first poll of the spring season out 
Tar Heels, no surprise, number one. They have two quality wins thus far against two good ACC teams in Louisville and Wake Forest. And Aaron Madsen already in peak Aaron Madsen form, uh, scoring all four of those goals that the Tar Heels have scored in the spring. Now, some other sports are wrapping up. That means postseason awards coming your way. And some Tar Heels have earned All-America recognition for NCAA Indoor Track. First team All-America, including the Distance Medley Relay team. Congratulations to those four. Also, Daniel MacArthur, who was also named the Region Athlete of the Year in All-America at the Indoor Shot Put. Second team All-America, there's Anna Kiefer for the long jump and Isaiah Palmer from the men's 400. So congratulations to all of them. Also cross country, the women finished number 14 at the NCAA championship. That is the best finish for the cross country program in more than a decade. And Paige Hofstadt was named an All-American is very happy to be so. As you can see in that photo, congratulations to Paige. And finally, gymnastics, seven Tar Heels earned all Eagle recognition. A reminder that Carolina in gymnastics competes in the Eagle, the East Atlantic Gymnastics League. There aren't enough ACC teams to have a full Atlantic Coast Conference, so they compete in the Eagle. You see Elizabeth Colton there. She was named the Eagle Gymnast of the Week for the second time. She won the all-around in the meet against William and Mary with a very impressive individual score of 39.5. Adam, baseball is also underway. Tar Heels swept Clemson last weekend. What a good weekend sweep. Heels now six and three in conference play. They are tied for first in the Coastal Division. And Adam, as it always seems to be with the Tar Heels, a big reason why they are successful is what they're doing on the mound. Yeah, Tar Heels are getting some great weekend pitching. Still finding themselves in the midweek on the mound, but a weekend feels like they've got a pretty steady rotation and they feel good about the arms they're using out of the bullpen. One member of that rotation, Max Alba, and if you ever see a hitter take a pitch and you wonder, well, why'd he take that pitch? It was obviously a strike. This is a two-pitch sequence from Alba where he starts him with the slider, <laughs> then comes back with a fastball that looks exactly like a slider, but never slides. And Clemson hitter left with nothing to do other than just watch it go through for strike three. That's a really good sequence from Max Alba. He's one of many talented Tar Heel starters. Of course, we had Austin Love on the show a couple weeks ago, and great to see. Tar Heels playing really well in the ACC where they're leading the Coastal. Tar Heels now up to number 14 in the national polls. Not just on the mound, by the way. Clemente Inklin, four home runs in four games. That'll earn you ACC player of the week for sure. If I'm not mistaken, I think those were his first career home runs. So to go from zero to four in four games, not too shabby, Clemente will accept it. And so will the ACC naming him ACC player of the week. Adam, this Carolina Insider is a stick shift and we need to change gears to the social drive. <laughs> Oh, let's get started as we bounce around social media and find some fun Carolina related uh, stuff. Let's use that word again uh, out there yeah. in social media. And Adam, we'll start with some NCAA tournament swag. That's why they all play and want to go to the tournament is to get gear. And so there you go. Some uh, people will know where you found that uh, that gear, Adam, for sure. Well. I'll tell you, that John Thompson book, I Came as a Shadow, that's a really good book. And I'm certain all the players are sitting there reading it this week during their free time. There's also a puzzle in there. We saw that Kendall Marshall had mm. completed his puzzle. Uh, and there are copious amounts of soaps and hand sanitizer. A year ago, we couldn't find hand sanitizer. Now it's stocked in your hotel room. You got all you could ever use. So this... This is why you play, James. I want a big dance towel or blanket, Adam. That was, that was impressive. Uh, well, Tar Heels are used to NCAA tournament swag, of course, because they go all the time. And as we mentioned, the 51st time, this was a really cool graphic. Anytime you can do one of these moving graphics, it's cool to watch happen, and especially when the Tar Heels are involved. So as you can see here, this is the year-by-year all-time NCAA tournament wins. If you're looking for the Tar Heels, they're at 17 right there. And Adam, this thing, you, you could, I could stare at this for days. I would watch a moving graphic like <laughs> this of just about anything, like episodes of MASH. Like I, I'd, That's a current thing that people are watching right, now. Yeah. 
And it, it's interesting because you see the winds fluctuate for a lot of other programs, but the Tar Heels just consistently plugging along. Watch out, Kentucky, in your rearview mirror. That's Ramesses up there, and he's about to come right past you. Boom. And, of course, UCLA is just kind of sitting there like, hey, guys, you remember the 60s? We're fine. We got plenty of wins. But so this ends up being very close. I wish I had the technical ability to do this. Yes. But I definitely do not. Uh, it ends up being very close with Kentucky and North Carolina up at the top. Tar Heels actually briefly take the lead here after a dry period there in the early 2000s. Tar Heels do briefly take the win in all-time victories. Kentucky, though, jumps back out in front. And when this graph comes to a close, you'll see Kentucky at 129 and Carolina at 126. Adam, I think the real start thing about this graph as it ends right there is the difference between the top five and then number six. Kentucky 129, Carolina 126, Duke 114, Kansas 108, UCLA 101. Then 32 wins later, you get to Michigan State. I think it really speaks to, to the long-term success of those five programs on top. There's a lot of discussion about the Blue Bloods. Well, there's your Blue Bloods right there. The other thing you have to remember is anytime you're in a race with Kentucky for wins, you got to watch out because they'll find some in the couch cushions. <laughs> you thought you took the lead and all of a sudden, we just found a dozen wins over the summer. We're going to add those in. Uh, but right now, Tar Heels got a chance this year, Jones. Got yes, a, they do. Got a chance to pass the Wildcats. Just go ahead, win four or more games in the NCAA tournament. Carolina takes the lead again. Of course, to do that, they'll have to pull a couple of upsets as the number eight seed. But Adam, the Tar Heels, we mentioned this at the top of the show. They've been the number eight seed in the NCAA tournament. This is the fourth time that they've been a number eight seed. The very first time was back in 1990, an all-time favorite Tar Heel play of mine. Second round of the 1990 NCAA tournament. Let's take a look and listen. Here's Woody Durham calling this Rick Fox buzzer beater over Oklahoma on the Tar Heel Sports Network. Eight seconds remain, score tied 77. Nate Humphrey hands King Reich the ball. Pushes in to Hubert Davis. Eight seconds. Davis trying to get free. Over to Fox. Fox, baseline. Up for the shot. Good. Off the glass. Oklahoma calls timeout. But the game is over. The game is over. Carolina has upset number one Oklahoma. How was that 31 years ago from this past Wednesday, just from yesterday, 31 years ago that shot happened. Rick Fox beats uh, number one Oklahoma in the second round. Tar Heels would eventually lose to Arkansas in the Sweet 16 that particular year. But Adam, also a number eight seed in the year 2000, Carolina advanced all the way to the final four that year, including a win over top seeded Stanford in the second round. Carolina also a number eight seed in 2013, where they did win their first round game, but fell to Kansas in Kansas City in the second round. But um, as far as winning percentage, that number eight seed has been pretty kind to the Tar Heels actually in the past. A lot of fun wins from that slot. That win over Oklahoma, one of the most fun kind of underdog wins in Carolina's NCAA tournament history. Oklahoma, if you don't remember, was really good and really brash yeah. under Billy Tubbs. Uh, Carolina able to get the win. I love that clip of Coach Smith. He's not hanging around to look and see if they're no. going to review no. the clock. We don't He's out. Do He's yeah. headed to the locker room. Rick King, let's go, boys. We're headed to the locker room. We're going to move on and play Arkansas in the next round. Mentioned that 2013 was the last time the Tar Heels were in number eight seed. A big part of that particular year's team was Reggie Bullock. And Reggie's still getting it done at the pro level, including having a big game uh, for the Knicks against the New York Nets earlier this week. And boy, the Knicks are having a uh, very solid season. Also, hey, it was Reggie's birthday. Hold on, show that graphic. Yeah, woo, happy birthday, Reggie. <laughs> That was uh, on Tuesday of this past week, so good to see Reggie Bullock uh, continuing to get it done. Reggie Bullock can shoot the basketball, Adam, no question there. And Reggie keeps up with the Tar Heels loyally. He, uh, he is one of those Tar Heels in the NBA who keeps close tabs on Carolina, so I'm sure he'll be watching the NCAA tournament this weekend. How about a couple other Tar Heels in the NBA? Tony Bradley getting a chance with the Philadelphia 76ers to get a little more time. Of course, they didn't want it to be this way. Neither did Tony with Joel Embiid suffering an injury, but uh, Tony getting the opportunity, Adam, and making it pay off. It's amazing how nimble and quick Tony Bradley looks in this package. Uh, that's not the same Tony Bradley that you remember from Carolina, but he is one of those 
those kind of underrated pro Tar Heels who you forget about from time to time, who's been able to, to make a nice career for himself and stick around for quite a while, and when he gets an opportunity, as he did here, able to produce. So good for Tony Bradley, and we mentioned that a big reason why Tony Bradley, let's just watch him get one more dunk there. We mentioned that the reason Tony Bradley was able to see a little more time was an injury to Joel Embiid, and Joel Embiid understands that. I mean, he's got to watch his back. Yeah. Well, that's a good front office idea. Build around Tony Bradley. You've already got Danny Green. We're basically just making a video game Tar Heel All-Star team, which is what we all do when we play those games anyway. Speaking of Danny Green, Adam, found this one out there as a woman, 94 years old, spent isolation during this COVID year studying the NBA. And she decided to fill out a notepad with her favorite players on each team and, oh, uh, there's Danny Green. He's my favorite player, co-favorite player, along with Tony Bradley on the 76ers. How do you think she knew during the year of isolation that Danny Green was going to go to Philadelphia? The recent, more recently, Adam. Oh, I thought maybe she was uh, making some GM moves <laughs> and she knew that Danny Green was going to make she likes moves. Kevin Durant on the Nets as well. So this yeah. is this season. She's up to date. She, I think she just started the research last summer. This year she really got into the personnel. Don't have one for the Toronto Repton, but we will soon. We'll <laughs> it's hard to pick your favorite <laughs> Repton. I, that, how many times has that been said? Many. All right, uh, let's finish things off here, Adam. Let's go to the ACC Network celebrating Women's History Month. And with the success of Carolina Women's Athletics, no surprise here that you see Karen Shelton, not just on this list, but at the top of this list as uh, the top female coach in ACC history. Hard to argue with the success and sustained success that Coach Shelton has had and you do that list in five years, I'm guessing Jenny Levy's on there. No, oh, absolutely. And then when you're talking about athletes in the history of the Atlantic Coast Conference, as far as women, the network ranked the top 10 and number one, a Tar Heel and Mia Hamm. Also see Christine Lilly, of another former uh, UNC soccer player at number seven, Aaron Madsen at number 10. Some great former names on there from other schools as well, but three Tar Heels in the top 10. Top five, you're on warning. Aaron Matson's coming for you. Adam, let's finish off with two folks who we like to talk about here on the show. That's Michael Jordan and Mia Hamm. So if you are old enough to remember, Michael Jordan and Mia Hamm had a great Gatorade spot back in the 1990s. They've rebooted that Gatorade spot with some more current athletes. But as you'll see, there's MJ. At his golf course, I believe, Adam. Has anyone ever looked more dubious than <laughs> Michael Jordan in this still where he's at his golf course, the Grove, where we know you can get yep. your Jordan emblazoned ice cubes. Yep. And he decided while I'm at the golf club, I'm going to go ahead and shoot a commercial. So, yes, they have updated this with a couple of uh, current athletes, but I think you'll see that uh, you're not going to let Michael Jordan and Mia Hamm go. You can. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. No, you can't. Yes, I can. Get more out of zero. Now available with protein. Yeah. Do we have the old commercial? Anything you can do, I can do better. I can do anything better than you. No, you can't. Yes, I can. No, you can't. Yes, I can. Mm. Adam, good. why does that one look so much older? I don't like that part. But is there anything else from 1991 that you could transport to 2021 and the viewing public instantly knows who those people are without right. having them identified on the screen than Michael Jordan and Mia Hamm? Anything else you would bring forward from 91, people would say, what's that old archive, weird looking footage? That's it's just MJ and Mia Hamm, two Tar Heels. When they are showing archives of this show 30 years from now, they're going to think the same thing. There's Jones and Adam on the Carolina Insider. Thanks so much for being with us. Uh, obviously a busy time of year, so we got a lot to bring you. Thanks for sticking with us through the show. Look forward to being back with you next week here on the Carolina Insider. See you later, Big Grit.